Good morning. Good morning. I'm Pastor Ann. I just want to uh, welcome you here this morning, and I pray that you meet the living Christ here today. We're starting a new series. It's called Ancient Stories of a Modern God, and uh, we'll learn from these stories how God will uh, come and be a part of our life. All right, well, with that, let's pass the love and peace of Jesus Christ to one another this morning. Good morning. How is everybody? Don't sit down and get comfortable. <laughs> please remain standing and uh, great to see you this morning. Uh, please join me in our call to worship. The mighty one speaks and summons the earth. From Zion, perfect in beauty. Listen, my people, and I will speak. Our God comes and will not be silent. All right. Uh, turn to page 139, and we're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 3. that we sing. Sometimes the voices of the world are louder than your still small voice. Help us to discern that loudest voice, not always the wisest voice. Open our ears and hearts to your call on our lives. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now page 463. And you may be seated if you promise to sing. Lord, speak to me that I may speak in living echoes of thy tone. As thou hast sought, so let me see thine erring children. Lost and low. Oh, strengthen me that while I 
stand firm on the rock and strong in thee. I may stretch out my loving hand to wrestle with the troubled sea. Oh, teach me, Lord, that I may teach the precious things thou dost impart, and wing my words that they may reach the hidden depths of many a heart. Oh, fill me with thy fullness, Lord, until my very heart overflow in kindling thought and glowing word thy love to tell thy praise to show oh use me lord use even me just now thou wilt and win and wear until thy blessed face i see thy rest thy joy thy glory So here we are today. We are um, praying for many people in our church and in our families, our extended families, our neighbors. Um, we want to put all of our hearts, uh, joys and trials and concerns right here at the altar this morning for God to take them in. I want to lift up Tammy Bauer as she continues to struggle and look for treatment and all those in our bulletin. Does anyone have anyone else they'd like to lift up this morning? Judy? My husband, Gerald. Okay. Anyone else? All right, let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are our rock and our redeemer. You take everything that is in our lives and lift them up when we are in joy and we praise you for all the gifts that you have poured out into our lives, all the blessings that have come throughout this week and throughout the years. And so, Lord, we just lift up the intentions on our hearts, the trials and challenges that face us in our families, our friends, our community, perhaps our church family. Lord, we hand these over to you. We lift up Carol, Judy's cousin, and Tammy as she continues to seek treatment. Lord, you are the great physician, and we just pray your presence upon all of those here today needing your healing, and all those in our family, our friends, that need that presence to make them whole in body, mind, and soul. Lord, we lift this up in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, who not only taught us how to live on this earth and bring your kingdom here to it, but also taught us how to pray. Won't you join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This is our time to give back to God with our tithes and our offerings. And we just thank you for all of your gifts, the times that you have sacrificed something in your life to give back to God's work in our church and in the world, and the times that you have given out of your abundance. So Lord, just uh, make sure you put your connection card in. And if you have your pledge card for 2020, we would really appreciate having that um, for the finance team this week. So I'd like to invite the ushers forward to give back to God what is actually given to us from him.
almighty and holy God, we thank you for all of the blessings you have poured out into our lives. We thank you in particular for these gifts, and we give them back to you as a sure and certain sign of our love for you and that we want your name to be known to the world. Bless these gifts and multiply them, that they would go out, and everyone that would receive them, that they would know your name, and every knee would bow. Lord, we lift this up in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Our readings this morning are from the book, first book of Samuel, chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not gone out yet, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went back and lay down. Again the Lord called, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel. Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Thank you, Janet. So we start this new series, Ancient Stories of a Modern God. So we're going to look at the story of Samuel today. And really this the little verse or story is about hearing or listening hearing God. Now, sometimes we just think everyday hearing. We might look at something like this little cartoon. Will you bring that cartoon up for me, Cody? Okay. Have you ever been this? I'm sorry I was wrong. What? Let me turn up my hearing aid. Could you say that again, please? <laughs> Have you ever been in that position where you just like someone to repeat something, right, or tell you? Well, we know when we're looking to hear from God, we can't direct them, right? We can't direct what God is going to say to us. There are times when we'd like to. When we want to say, Lord, speak to me, confirm that I am right, right? That I am thinking right. But in reality, it's not about us. When God speaks, he speaks what he wants to speak. Now, it might also look like something like this. Have you remember the Verizon guy? From, uh, that walked around all those commercials. He went all around the world, had his phone in his ear, and he said, can you hear me now? Good. Then he'd go up to the mountaintop, can you hear me now? Good. And they're just trying to prove that this Verizon network is the best network. You could go anywhere around the world and hear somebody through your phone. But we have to ask ourselves the question, what is our signal strength for us in hearing from God? Do we have one bar, two bars? Do we have dead spots when we don't hear from God? Or is it four bars and we're hearing from him? Our communication with God has to be open and we have to be listening and sometimes not always hearing the things we want to hear, but perhaps hearing things that we might not really know about. Sometimes I wonder, is, is God up there saying, Anne, can you hear me now? Like, are you listening now? Have you asked me now? So I'm sure you have felt that way in your life or wondering, Lord, can you hear me now? So here's the thing with Samuel. 
Um, during this time, during this time of Israel, uh, in Israel, it was quiet. God was not really alive in people's lives or speaking very much. And Samuel, the story of Samuel, is a transition time where God goes from silent to speaking. So if you look at the first verse in Samuel, and just go ahead and pull back up that next slide on the scripture, we can see that God is not speaking in this first verse. Cody, if you would give me that first verse. Thank you. Uh, in this first verse, we can see in those days the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. So God is not speaking through anyone. So it starts out telling us not about God speaking, but about God's silence. Now, I want to read to you what happens in Proverbs when God is not speaking. In Proverbs 29, chapter 29, verse 18, it says, Where there is no revelation, people cast off constraint. And so we see society go from bad to worse when God is not moving in our community and in our nation. So we see that this is biblical, that God needs to be alive. Now, the other thing about this little opening is it sets the stage that Samuel is um, kind of under the watch, or his teacher is a man named Eli. And so Samuel is, according to some of the historic documents from Josephus and other historical uh, documents, Samuel at this time is about 12 years old. So Samuel is the son of Hannah, and Hannah has dedicated Samuel to God and he's in working with the priest Eli is the teacher now if we keep going we you might recall in this um, uh, these verses can you give me one more slide on the verses okay so the other thing we might want to recognize in here is that Eli is going blind or his eyes are weak so I don't know if he's getting older in age probably but it's also probably some symbolism for his spiritual vitality. So even as a priest, his spiritual vitality is waning a little bit. How do we know this? When Hannah comes to Eli to get advice on how to, to have a child and for her, her, him to bless her, he thinks she's drunk. And here she is just praising God. And so she does become pregnant, a little bit of a miracle there, and dedicates Samuel back to God and takes him to the monastery for that. The other thing in here that it talks about is this lamp of God. It sets the time and place of what's going on. Go back one slide for me, Cody. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. So the lamp of God in Exodus 27, it gives us what the lamp of God is. It says that Aaron and his sons are to keep the lamps burning before the Lord from evening till morning. So by the ark, these lamps are supposed to be kept lit all night long until morning. And it's a lasting ordinance among the Israelites for generations to come. So the priests are responsible for this. And Samuel is sleeping in there to keep the lights burning, right, to keep the oil refilled. And it's in this time and place where he is serving a common overnight, just sleeping, when God calls him. So we hear in the scripture today that uh, was read by Janet that Samuel hears a voice. Samuel, and he gets up, thinks it's Eli. Eli says, go back to bed. Hears it again. Eli says, go back again. It's not until the third time that Eli, it clicks spiritually. Oh my gosh, Samuel, you're hearing a voice that's not me, and it might be actually God speaking to you. And he gives them the advice, Lord, speak. And I think that's on the scripture, or on the um, slide. He says, Lord, speak, for your servant is listening. Now, Lord, speak, for your servant is listening. You're going to have to skip down about three slides, two slides there, Cody. Yep, there it is. So uh, this is Eli giving the instruction. And then the next slide is the actual verse that he responds when God calls him the last time. So he, I want to just point a few things out. This, speak for your servant is listening, 
is one of the best prayers you can pray. You should be praying this prayer every Saturday night or Sunday morning before you come to church. Lord, what do you want to say to me today? Through the hymns, through the word of God, through the sermon, speak to me. Instruct me. Let me know you're present. Speak to me. Show yourself to me. And notice that Eli gives instruction to Samuel that he has to ask for it. He didn't say to, Eli didn't say to Samuel, just lay there and God will speak to you. He said, you need to respond, say this. Now, one of the verses said, and set verse 7 in our scripture today said uh, something to the effect of that the reason Samuel didn't hear God or know it was God is because he had not heard the word of God yet. He had not heard God speak to him. He needed instruction, which is what Eli was there for. So after Samuel understands and hears God speak to him, then he can go on through his life and be in a conversation with God. God doesn't really speak to many people in the Bible. Even there's lots of stories in the Bible, but the prophets are often the place where God speaks and then the prophets speak to the people. So here we see in this particular instance many, many reasons why we don't hear God. Many reasons why we don't hear God. We could be like Samuel and need more instruction. We need to maybe study the Bible more with a Bible study or by ourselves, the book, whatever. We may need to understand how God speaks to us. So we may need instruction. We may be like Eli, where we're a little bit spiritually diffused, if you will. He's getting a little weak spiritually, and he needs a revival in his life, and he needs to pray for that revival. Now, the other reason we might not hear from God is Eli had sons, and the sons were very disobedient. They mocked the priesthood. And in mocking the priesthood, God, they were disobedient to God's ways. And so we see God didn't speak through his sons because they're disobedient. So we may have a part of our lives we have to change to be aligned with God's ways. And I think the last one is something that we just don't think about every day, is we have to ask. Jesus tells us, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Jesus, if you look at the stories of Jesus, he will tell us to ask. We have to ask God to show up. Samuel had to ask. Jesus tells us to ask. Even Moses had to ask. I don't know, you could probably go to Abraham and everywhere else too for this, but I'm going to give you the Moses story. Now, the Moses in Exodus chapter 33, he actually asked God to show up. He asked God to see him. And I want you to see through the scripture that all Moses does is ask. Everything after the ask is the action of God, right? You cannot manufacture. You can't try to get the answer you want from God. You just have to ask, and then God does all the work afterwards, right? And that's where we have to let go. Right? Once we ask, we have to let go and let God. This is the hardest thing for all of us to do. When, whether it's illness or family or whatever, it's hard to give it over to God and ask him to take it. So here it is, Exodus chapter 33. It's titled, Moses and the Glory of God. So Moses starts a conversation with God and is kind of complaining a little bit, whining. Look, God, you have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. In other words, I cannot do all this work, right? I know you by name. He says that, he goes, look, I think you found favor with me. You tell me this, but I'm hurting here. This is what Moses is saying. He has this conversation with God, and then in verse 18, he says this, fine, show me your glory. He asked, Lord, show me your glory. Show me. I want to see you. 
That is a strong, have you ever asked to really see God? I'm like, not quite there with Moses, right? God really shine his light right in front of me? Well, so here's what he does. He asks this, and then from there in the text, God takes it. Moses has to back off, right? Moses has to let go, and this is what we have to do. And it says, and the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there's a place near me where you may stand on a rock. So God picks a place, takes Moses to this place. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Moses doesn't move. God puts him in the cleft, holds his hand over him to pass by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. So God shows up, but God shows up how God shows up, the way he wants to show up. So oftentimes, we want it to be the way we want it, kind of like with my husband repeating, I'm sorry to me. (laughs) He doesn't have to report too many sorries. He's not really all that crazy about hurting my feelings. Or maybe I don't have any feelings. I don't know. But either way, I, you know, we get to the mode or to the point where we want to direct God on how he's going to communicate with us and what he's going to do for us. And we have to be in this situation is when God calls us or we're calling out to God, we have to request what we want. We have to call on him. We have to either want to see him, have him show up and speak to us in some way and then let go and let God tell us what's going to go from there. Now, we'll say this about how God shows up. I think God shows up and speaks to us in a variety of ways. In some ways, it's sound, but in a lot of ways, it's feelings. Have you ever felt or heard the peace that goes beyond all understanding? Have you ever been in a situation where this peace has come on over you, and you're like, this is not me. I feel this peace, and I know everything's okay, even though I'm in the midst of a storm. God gives us the sound or feeling of peace that we cannot produce. In uh, John Wesley, he gave the sound or feeling of assurance. When John Wesley's heart was strangely warmed at Aldersgate, it was an assurance that God was with him, that it was going to be okay. Sometimes we might hear the sound or feeling of hope. Right? We might find like, oh my gosh, God is actually bigger than my problem, and I now have hope. We might, God might speak to us in hope, and God speaks to us a lot in love. The sound and feeling of love, the love that is broader and bigger and wider and deeper than we really can imagine, that love comes to us through him speaking to us. Probably the primary way we hear from God is through his word, this Bible. If we open it up and say, God, speak to me, I'll bet he'll speak to you. I bet he'll lead you and direct you on everything you do. Our our thing is we have to be able to pick it up. We have to put the time in to either go to the Bible study or pick up another book that's a reference book, or read it on our own, or ask me, like, hey, there isn't a time when I can do what I want to do, and you ask us if, uh, at the staff if we can help you in some way in this space. You know, it reminds me of the boy who fell out of bed. Five-year-old boy fell out of bed. Of course, he's crying. His mom comes in, picks him up, puts him on the side of the bed. He said, she says, what happened? He says, you know, I don't, I don't know, but I, I think I just stayed too close to where I got in. And I think that happens to us in our spiritual journey. 
in our journey of faith, we get stuck. Sometimes we're stuck right at the beginning, right? And we know we're to grow in faith. How do we know it? It's in the word. Both Paul and Peter tell us we are to grow in faith. In Ephesians, Paul talks about in chapter 4, verses 14 to 6, that we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching. Instead, he says all of us will grow together in the church. We will grow and build each other up in love. We will grow. Growth is a key word in our faith journey. If you look in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, here Paul talks to them and he says, Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity. There's a path. You start one place and you move along the path. Peter does the same thing. First book of Peter, chapter 2, verse 2, like newborn babies, craves pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Key word, grow. In 2 Peter, he ends the letter on verse 18 of chapter 3 and says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Peter and Paul knew we are called to grow in faith. We start one place and we're on a journey. That's why we have this discipleship pathway. Put up that discipleship pathway for me, Cody. Here in the discipleship pathway, it seems simple. But this, growing along this pathway, it is not my responsibility. It's not Morgan's responsibility as part of Christian formation, the director of Christian formation. It is your responsibility to grow in faith. Everybody has their own responsibility for their growth in their faith. And you can get stuck. Like a little kid, you could get stuck with a kid falling off the bed and searching and exploring. Now, the thing that moves you from exploring, I know you're in searching and exploring at least that phase because you're here. Because if you're not searching and exploring, you're not in church, right? I haven't, you haven't gotten that far. But if you're at least, if you're at least coming to church, you're at least in searching and exploring. And it doesn't matter where you are. There is no right or wrong. Every person here went through the journey. So you may be close or Christ-centered. Great, that's good. But you, you are called anywhere along this journey. And the thing is, is you're responsible for your movement. If you're in exploring and you've served and you've gone out and you feel like God is present, but you haven't gone to growing, you haven't really opened up the Bible outside of Sunday morning. And it's only until you're in a Bible study or working with someone or using some books or something that you're learning this word that you're growing. That growing part is being in a discipleship class, being in a class or, or studying it in some way, shape, or form. So if you find yourself stuck in exploring, you have to step out and then get into a place. And, and we're here to help you do that if you don't find a place to do that. The second one is if you're in growing and you've gone to every class and you're still trying to figure out how you're supposed to grow, you're stuck. Because to go to grow to close to Christ, there's two major things that move you in your faith. One is you share your faith, that you can tell your story. You share your faith with your kids, your grandchildren, community, other people you know. You might share it with a stranger. You might only share it with a few people. But sharing your faith moves your faith. And the other thing that's moving your faith and close to Christ and Christ is centered is surrender. You are handing your life over one thing at a time. You hand over your children. You hand over your spouse. You hand over whatever God is giving you. You hand over your money, your resources. You give and surrender something to God. And that is what moves your faith and close to Christ and Christ-centered. When you are ultimately giving your entire life away 
for what Christ wants to do in this world. You are responsible for your faith journey, not anyone else. If you're stuck and want to talk about it, I'm here, Morgan's here to talk about it. We can help you move your faith. But it is your responsibility to take that next faithful step where God is calling you. I think this is our challenge. Our challenge in this November and December season, this Advent season we're going to come up on, right? Our challenge is to ask. You have to ask God to show up. You have to ask God to speak to you. And then you have to step out where you are in your faith journey. God, if, if, can I do this? Where is God calling you to move your faith? You will be surprised how he will show up. It will not be how you expected it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the many times you have come into our life, times you have called our name and we heard you. Lord, we're sorry for all the times you called our name and we didn't hear you or didn't respond. But more importantly, we are here today gathered together so that you would, in fact, be more alive in our lives. So, Lord, call us to go out and bring your kingdom here to this earth. We lift this up in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Page 451. Amen. Amen.